Aloha, you are now entering behind the scenes and beyond the talk with TEDx Honolulu. I'm your host for the series, Justini Spiritu, and today's guest is Mariko Chang, who is our artist in residence curator. And we also have Shane Robinson, who was our 2015 artist in residence. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks, Thanks. for having us. Awesome. It's great that it worked out. Yeah, and so I don't know too much about the Artists in Residence program, and this is actually the first time TEDx Honolulu has participated in the program. So Mariko, if you could kind of give us the background and how many other TEDx are participating in it. Sure, sure. So um, like Justine mentioned, this, is our in, this was our inaugural, um, inaugural Artists in Residence, or AIR program. And it was Genesis who um, initiated um, this project. And she had met someone in her travels with the various TEDx gatherings. And it was Mount Hood who had put together um, basically a template for these programs. And the Artist in Residence program is just, it's an opportunity to highlight a different type of speaker. Um, that being a visual artist, someone who can take the theme for the year and give it a different kind of lens um, to kind of illuminate what's, um, what the topic of the TEDx conference is all about. Cool. And then how did you get into the position of being the curator and, and leading the effort? Yeah, so I volunteered originally for social media, I think, and um, Genesis, who is our licensee holder, kind of was aware of my background in, the fine, art, in fine arts. And um, when this opportunity came about, she just kind of like threw it out there and we we're like, yeah, let's run with it. And so that was the beginning of, or the end of last year. And how many mm -hmm. years had you volunteered with TEDx at that time? Um, it was just a few months, to be honest. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I love hearing. So. We have so many stories of these volunteers coming on board. They're just like, okay, I'm just going to join this team. Exactly. And then Genesis or someone kind of singles them out and like, how about you lead this project? I know. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. So great. So it's been a tremendous opportunity. And with um, Genesis just knowing um, all the volunteers' kind of skill sets and interests, um, when the opportunity arises, you just kind of have to go with it. Okay, mm -hmm. and then so did you look to other, and I know you mentioned in, in your video there's like seven other TEDx's that have participated in the program? No, there were seven this year, right? Yeah, yeah. so there was a whole bunch of um, TEDx regional chapters, I guess if you want to call them, that have also jumped onto this pilot program. And it was, it's really just an experiment to see what other folks come up with. Um, and for, I know, for example, like TEDx, there was one in Australia that we were kind of looking at. And we were all intending to kind of report back on our experiences and continue the program and grow, um, grow it individually in our respective locations. Great. Awesome. So how did you guys end up selecting Shane to be our first artist in this program? <laughs> Maybe you can speak to that a little bit more, but it was through a personal connection, right? Personal Genesis. connection. I'm not sure why she chose me. I'll throw that back to you. <laughs> uh, but Genesis and I made a connection last year. She was on Maui for TED Ed mm -hmm. at Seabury Hall. And she is friends with uh, my partner, Roxanne Darling. And they actually stayed, Genesis and her friends, stayed at, overnight at our house. And the next day, I gave them a tour of my art studio. I had a, a, a working painting studio in an old pi um, pineapple cannery. Apparently, I said something that day that Genesis, that set her back on her heels and that she remembered. And she, so when the theme came up for this year, she said, I immediately thought of you. So she reached out to me in email. So said, you didn't have to go through the TEDx Honolulu audition process that <laughs> all the speakers go through. That I we, was it keeps getting compared to American Idol. So you really? didn't have to go through that. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't know that. I was completely unaware of that. Uh, I received an email from Genesis, and um, she said, "Here's our. We're doing this uh, mm -hmm. artist residence program. Here's a little bit of information about that. I'd love to talk to you about that. Based on our theme, your the way you work and your artwork came to mind, and I wanted to see if you were interested." Awesome. And was it immediately you said yes, or did you, were you kind of taken aback? Um, because I knew her, I knew it was real. Otherwise, if it was <laughs> somebody I didn't know, it was like, yeah, what's, <laughs> what's, what's the scam on this? Um, the opportunity to speak at any kind of TEDx event, I mean, I would have to be like going out of the country or something not mm -hmm. to do it for the exposure, for, mm -hmm. the, for the quality of people that you're surrounded by, um, for the connections that you could possibly make. And then also, 
based on the fact that it was the first artist in residence program along with six others in the world besides Mount Hood mm -hmm. and that we would have a little bit of input into the the formation of of the, of the program because based on what we report back Mount Hood is then going to take it to Papa Ted and see if they then might um, sprinkle it down to the other Ted's but it was it's a lot of work and Mount Hood already has a really great what they call it like the a toolkit toolkit yeah um, that of we best were, practices yeah exactly that's awesome yeah. this is a great way then to kind of collaborate with the other TEDx groups yeah. and so let's backtrack a little bit you know you it's it's a huge honor to be selected for this for TEDx what how long has TED kind of been in your life or that you when were you introduced to it and why is it such a big deal to well, you to back, be back in 96 um, I started an internet company on the mainland and so we've been involved in technology and and almost moved to the the uh, the west coast so in the Silicon Valley and stuff, but we luckily luckily stayed in, in Santa Fe. But because of that connection, we've always known about TED. It was very exclusive. Uh, one, it was very expensive, and the first TEDs, you had to be invited. Oh, it was I not something really that fine. anybody could do, go to. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very exclusive, very high end. And so it was one of these things like, oh, someday maybe I'll get an invite to TED <laughs> if we go or something. <laughs> As they branched out and opened up, then it gave a lot of opportunity to other people and, and all the other TEDx events. Yeah. But it's still a, a, a huge honor to be, to be involved. Um, so that's how I knew about TED. Knew about TED a decade ago or more mm -hmm. when it very first started up. When Do you have a favorite talk or one that was particularly memorable? Yes, the one that, the one that I actually have uh, that I've downloaded uh, and that I have is Amanda Palmer's. And what was the um, topic on that one? She, uh, uh, well, if you, if you know, she's a musician, an artist. Um, she is married to Neil Gaiman, who's a, a science fiction author. Um, her talk, uh, how would I explain it? Um, she used to be a street performer. And she used to be one of those living statues. Mm -hmm. And um, she started there with her talk and about what it taught her about interacting with people. And if someone would come up and um, she, would, she would hand out, this, look at this flower and watch them walk by. It's a beautiful, I mean, you'll tear up when you watch her talk. It's amazing and it's funny. Um, but sh what she learned in terms of interaction, giving and taking, she has applied through the, the next couple of decades of her professional career when she had this huge blow up with her record company and decided to take her art, her artistic control in her own hands and give away her music when all the record companies, and this was a, a while ago, when all the record companies were trying to figure out how to stop people from taking music, she turned it around, kind of like Nine Inch Nails said, and she said, have it. Mm -hmm. And what came back to her was tenfold, or morefold, than mm -hmm. she had ever made before, because the people, the outreach, and just the, the last line of her, of her TED Talk is, um, instead of, wow, I should have I should have written it down. <laughs> it's, instead of instead of trying to figure out how to sell people music, oh, this is I'm going to butcher it. Um, Just put your own spin on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, instead of instead of trying to figure out how to to make people buy music, we should figure out how to let them buy music. It's just a small paradigm shift in the way of thinking. It's like we can't give music away. People must buy music. Uh -huh. And her idea is, mm -hmm. how do we let people? buy music. She lets people buy music by, by downloading as much as they want and then they give back to her mm -hmm. uh, completely on a volunteer basis. And, it's worked wonderful. and that was yeah. all in a, that 18 minute time frame that you're I given. For 13, <laughs> minutes or something. 13 minutes. It's, it's in my mind, uh, it's so dense and there's so many different lessons in there. Mm -hmm. Amanda Palmer, wherever my camera is, uh, <laughs> search Ted and Amanda Palmer and it's, uh, it's great. That's awesome. And that's cool. I mean, that must have been in one of the later ones since Ted in the beginning was limited. It's, more within, to, it's within the past few years. Okay, yeah. And so yeah. It's, it's awesome to, to know that the, the subject area and the people speaking have um, been a wider variety. Mm -hmm. And were you involved or aware of other, it's, you've lived in a number of cities. Have you participated in or um, attended any other TEDx no, uh, Roxanne has in Maui. There's, there's, uh, I think they're in their third or fourth year. Third for sure. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, of course I know about those, and I know about Sydney, and there's some other large TEDx events around, around the world that consistently do great programs and pull some, some big speakers. Obviously I know about, about Honolulu, but we moved to Maui about four years ago. Cool, yeah, I just love it as a, a forum to just feature the people in our own local community. And, and what we've realized is, you know, hundreds of people audition and apply for, mm -hmm. these, for these positions, and they're all worth, like, listening to. They're all worth being on stage, and everyone has their, like, great idea and great story. So yeah. it's so exciting. <laughs> how about you? Um, how did you hear about TEDx and start getting involved? Sure, I think I was in grad school and I was doing research on leadership. And so to find out about like who are um, up and coming leaders, I just watched TED mm. videos for like nights and nights. And I came across, and she, this is my favorite talk, um, Emily Pilliton, and she did a talk about um, design solutions okay. and uh, for third world countries, for everyday things. It's just thinking about design as ways to address our, our needs. Yeah, so that was a really powerful one. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's talk a little bit, going back to the, the Artist in Residency program, sure. and it was the first time that you guys just made it up as you went. How did it like <laughs> unfold, and how did it happen, and how did you guys decide how we're going to integrate this art into, you know, walk us through it. Here we yeah. have the, the logo that was designed for the event. Oh, oh, let's awesome. let's backtrack for a second. Okay. And so, as I said, <laughs> so we've had in our background um, your uh, panels, your your painting that was on stage for the event. Yes, a photograph and, actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we've never acknowledged it before because <laughs> I don't know the story behind it. So, if you want to give us a little detail about it, or about about this particular piece. Yeah. Um, we used to live in Kailua here on Oahu, and I had visited an art show on the mainland and walked across the room, was drawn to this what I thought was a painting. And, and a very abstract, just a big color field, and got over there and learned it was a photograph. And said, how do they make a photograph like this that looks like a painting? It was just a color field of yellow and black. And they said, I don't know, but this book, it's in this book. And so I spent $60 on this book. And took oh, it home. I told you. And I know. <laughs> These are answered right. everything. Yeah. I don't know how much <laughs> it is. It's in this book. Here, <laughs> selling this $40 book for $60. <laughs> yeah. And uh, went home. and in, and. It, there was nothing in the book about the technique, about how any of this stuff, it was, a, it was a, uh, a doctoral thesis, this book basically was. So I went on Google and searched for a couple of hours, abstract photographs, how to make abstract photographs, how to, anything I could think of, and couldn't find anything, and was quite frustrated. The next morning, I was, um, there was a pattern where water had boiled off in the bottom of this pan, and it's like, I wonder if I shot that if I would get a reflection of my camera you know, in the bottom of this stainless steel pan or whatever. So I grabbed my camera, and something happened. I moved the camera. Oh, I, I had a long, the, um, there wasn't enough light. So the shutter stayed open for a while, and I didn't check my settings. And when I looked at the image on the back, I'm like, that's an abstract photograph. It literally downloaded, and the story I tell is that, like it downloaded into my brain, like I said in my talk, that I understood how it, was, it could, could be done. There's many different ways, but I understood how it could be done. Long exposure, move the camera, mm -hmm. high contrast, and about 576 photos later, 45 minutes later, I had shot <laughs> towels. That was one of the original towels that I had shot that day, beach towels hanging out over our lanai. Uh, the sky, my kayak, my dog, just everything by leaving the exposure, or the, uh, the, the shutter open, and just moving the camera a little bit, moving like this. Cool. And so then the, the series has grown, grown from there. Awesome. Well, in our next segment, we'll get a little more. Sorry, I like threw us off track there. <laughs> <laughs> so our next segment, we'll get into, again, how it was kind of integrated the, into the event and how that all worked. So first, we're going to take a quick little break. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an art show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. 
And we don't only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. Aloha and welcome back to Behind the Scenes and Beyond the Talk with TEDx Honolulu. I'm your host, Justine Spiritu. Today's guests are Mariko Chang, who is our artist in residence curator, and Shane Robinson, who was our 2015 artist for our event, Paradigm Shift. Really quickly, let me remind you guys, please feel free to engage with us through Twitter at ThinkTechHi, and we will answer all your questions. Um, so we kind of recapped the background of the program, but if we can get into more details of how, being this was the first run for TEDx Honolulu, how did it go? How did you guys know what to do? And you guys can go on about that. Um, taking a step back now that I think about it, um, as Shane would probably agree, it went, it was over in like a blink because we had engaged Shane uh, about the beginning of this year and we had a dead, hard deadline of the conference on March 28th and so we really gave him about almost two months to um, really begin to internalize the the theme of the of the program um, which then included all of the tasks which were to create the work to fabric fabricate it to ship it um, bring it here, the whole installation, um, and then to attach a talk on, on top of all of that. Right. So Yeah, and all the other speakers I think we got on board in like October or November. Yeah. And a little more prep time. Right, right. <laughs> and then so is the point too, do you create original pieces? The, the, in, in the Mount Hood Toolkit, that is what they've grown into over the past couple of years. They've This was their fourth year, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so the people, because uh, the people, their artists and residents have about a 10 month um, <laughs> at lead time, um, they then create work specific for the event. So this work was repurposed for this event based on the theme and what Genesis had seen when she visited on Maui. It's cool. We've got our own, TEDx Honolulu has our own style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hawaiian <laughs> time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we were just, I mean, it was so ser serendipitous and that Shane had this work on hand that fits so nicely with our theme. Um, well, and we were able to, um, it just so happened that I was able to get over like a month in advance or something. That was crucial actually to the whole process was Shane's willingness to come over as well as your organizational skills. Well, that's, the, that's, <laughs> that's the database computer geek. Uh, um, but I was able to hop over in conjunction with another part, a reason for the trip mm -hmm. uh, and get into the venue and take photos. And then so, and I set Mariko up on stage with a piece of paper and then removed her from the photo, but use the piece of paper as a, uh, a size. So I know the piece of paper is eight and a half by 11. I can then make a mock-up. And so I was able to share mock-ups of several different artworks. Yeah, and he went through his entire iterative process while we were trying to actually problem solve how this would actually work um, based on time constraints, cost constraints, all of the resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also during that visit, we found out that we couldn't drill into the ceiling. We couldn't yeah. hang anything from the ceiling. <laughs> so this, this large piece that's 26 feet wide had to be freestanding or oh. in some way supported, but not, uh, and the stage is relatively thin. Yeah, it's like 10 it feet. wasn't too deep. So we had about two feet to be able to support it, hang it, yeah. and that type of thing. And we do have a couple pictures of the speakers with uh, the panels okay. uh, that you're speaking of. We have, um, and there's a couple things that we kind of created or integrated with the art. So we have the panels that were on stage for all the presentations and which mm -hmm. looked really great. You know, it was, it was really dark room and then you have like your beautiful pieces behind the speakers, which was awesome. Um, another thing is the programs, mm -hmm. which I mentioned that I was really excited about um, from the sustainability team side. We really wanted to discourage like having a like 10 or 12 page program and what we were able to create and I don't know what came first of like how it came together perfect is that they created Genesis created a 
like commemorative poster, yeah. and then the program became one side with the day's agenda, all the volunteers, all our sponsors. So all that info was on one side, and then one of your pieces was on the other the, side. The, the actual was piece was on the other side. So it was, it was literally, like you said, it was literally a poster. You could hang that. You could hang. The, yeah, the it, yeah, it the, was great. To like, then it, it, I mean, it gave people a purpose to like keep it, you yeah. know, instead of just the words awesome. and stuff. So, but also the program, great. the PDF that was created was was gorgeous. I had nothing yeah. to do with that. It was <laughs> whoever did it was beautiful. It was just. And it's what we right actually hope to do with the future of this program is to really brand each event mm -hmm. with this with the artwork that ties in so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the the PDF that you're talking about is a 24 page. Uh, document that's up on our website. I think if you just go on the home screen right now, you can you can click through it. Okay. And not only does it have like the cover page to it, but then it's just like in every page. Yeah, it's, it's super really beautiful. nicely integrated. Super nice. So does that cover that the the panel, of the speakers, the program, or the other? Did you have pieces, uh, other pieces besides on stage at the event throughout it? No, did I make no, that not up? There, were, there was time constraints, and we had to decide where can we put our time and resources. Mm -hmm. And so they went to the stage and then the PDF and the poster. The poster, I was surprised. The, I didn't know anything about the poster until we showed up. There. Really? Yeah. You didn't know yeah. that? Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. I, there, were, there were rumblings about this really <laughs> yeah. great poster. Oh, yeah. And I just figured it was, they misspoke and said, program. Uh huh. Yeah, so. That's cool. Were you able to keep one? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So the way this has played out, is this something we're going to try to do every year, every main event? I think it's definitely something we're going to continue. Um, it just added a different dynamic to the, the program, having someone come in and bring some sort of art piece that can then have all these different um, types of channels, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it's great, you know, seeing what you guys did in two months. Imagine if you had the whole <laughs> planning time. <laughs> that's so that's where we are now, definitely, um, kind of thinking about when we can release this information. And maybe we won't um, approach just one artist this time, but actually have it have a call out to artists. Um, and then do the put them to... through the American Idol audition <laughs> process. Yeah, yeah just something like that. that. According to the toolkit, one of my responsibilities then is to help and mentor the next artist. And so it, there's also this pass along uh -huh. that I don't know if happens with the other speakers or not, um, but that you, so that you, the artists each year learn from the previous year of uh, what worked, what didn't, maybe a, a better understanding of the venues, like, oh, no, we can't do this in that venue mm -hmm. and that type of thing. And then how about touching base? You mentioned with the Mount Hood group that you guys would kind of come together to share best practices. Have you guys done that yet with the other cities? That we debriefed internally, I know, after, um, after the conference and kind of reported back and just kind of left it in in their hands as how they'd like to move forward. Mount Hood's event was like a month or six weeks after ours, right? Yeah, and so they were, they were the ramping <laughs> up. They were ramping up to theirs. Uh -huh. And then all this and then they had seven different TEDx reporting to them. And so I think they're mm -hmm. um, digging out from under They're still yeah. like trying to get <laughs> to, trying to process it all. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Interesting. And so being from Maui, and you know, we talk with the speakers about the whole kind of cohort process. Um, but you and you know, you were able to participate through kind of the run throughs. Mm -hmm. But the day of the event, you know, we meant you mentioned you were one of the first speakers, and then so you kind of got to chill and integrate yes, during so the day. Nice. Like, can you kind of tell us about your experience that? Well, they, so it was it was um, it was stressful and nice. The stressful part was we had to put up the work that morning before they opened the door. So we had about two hours to get the work here, set it up. It had never been assembled before. So I created this whole structure that I hoped would hang <laughs> from, yes. from some metal bars there. And then I thought, 20 minutes, half an hour, I'll have this thing together. An hour and a half later, we are oh sweating. God. The doors are opening in 15 oh minutes, and we're still hanging stuff and hoping it's going to hang. And, but it all came together. And so that was done. That was the most stressful part. And then we just hung out, the four of us, there were four speakers in each of, I think, three time slots. Mm -hmm. We just hung out in the green room. And um, I was doing a lot of Instagram. And that type of thing to keep my mind off of. And then the talk was done. It yeah. was, you know, I, was, I did my nine minutes. And it was like, I don't even remember it, really. Then I did you get to do blur. a lot of interacting um, afterwards, during the breaks, during the lunch? Did you have people that 
you know, I mean, the, actually, the speakers are pretty like accessible and stuff during that. Yeah, time. actually, what happened during uh, the lunchtime because uh, uh, was people came up to me, audience members came up to me, and said, you know, I'm doing that or I want to do that, you know, because my our, my talk was based upon trying to find out who you really are, what is it that that you that drives you, that's your passion. Maybe you've been told you can can't do something, mm -hmm. but you still have this drive and desire to, or whatever. And so that's what surprised me most is the chord that it struck in the aud in some audience members enough that they actually approached me, you know, d throughout the day. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, otherwise, I sat in the audience. I sat in the audience, so I was I didn't go into the green room or that type of thing because I wanted to take in the experience because I had never blended been. in with the crowd and yeah. had the well and give supports and yeah. you know doing doing some snapping some social media pics to share, to bring other people in to see. Cool, then I'm curious to know as an artist, and I'm not sure what other kind of speaking engagements you had or that you do, and you know, having your art in a gallery versus in this kind of presentation or forum, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the difference in um, the TEDx format versus in what terms, else you're used to? In terms of the presentations or speaking we've done, because we were in the internet so early, starting around 1996, um, when we were trying to convince our clients to use email instead of faxes. We were, we were fortunate to be at the very beginning of uh, blogs and content management system, uh, podcasts. I was the first, within the first 30 podcasters in the world, I did a podcast from Kailua. And so because of that, we got invited around the country to speak on, oh, cool. on what's a blog. Um, um, how do you use video on a website? Because that was before YouTube. So how are we posting videos and that type of thing? A lot of that tends to be you behind a table with two or three other people, and then a room of you know several hundred geeks that want to learn <laughs> how one thing, uh -huh. but they all want to learn something different. Oh, and that's so exciting. after your twenty minute <laughs> talk or your or whatever, then you spend an hour and a half answering <laughs> questions as people file by. So that was very different. Also, we didn't have to really prepare for those types of talks. Mm -hmm. We would just show up. We would bring gear because people, because geeks love to see gear. We'd lay it out on the table, and then we'd talk about how we do our thing. TEDx talk, I really, I had to prepare. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was the most stressful and, and different part was trying to squeeze it into seven minutes, at, but get my um, my point across. And I wrote like I think four completely different versions. Oh, you gotta do like every version. We should do that. Oh, I can. I can. Like, I, and I, and the I, TEDx Honolulu and I, draft speeches. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, they were. Then they were each very, very different. Because I was just, and they're even very different than my explanation on the homepage or on, on my page of what it said I was going to do. Oh, of course. They're very different from that too. So, <laughs> but I just it. One of the things is I figure, well, I'll, I'll just see where it takes me and what really speaks to me. And as that talk came came together in terms of the theme of Paradigm Shift, that's the one that kept landing. Yeah. Well, that's what's so wonderful about these TED Talks is they're the best ones are just completely genuine and authentic. And you get to know the person uh, through whatever project that they're talking or, about or idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's interesting, especially the really good TED Talks like uh, um, Amanda Palmer. People that are performers make it look so easy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and not rehearse it and not scripted, but obviously that takes a lot of work and a lot of talent and experience to make it look that easy. Mm -hmm. What about, so with your, the blog stuff, did you get to travel and you're speaking to people you've never met before? Oh yeah, yeah, and it's like so going to a large conference where there's 1,500 people and, and you would do a session in the morning and a session in the afternoon. Actually in 2008, uh, uh, Roxanne put together a pod camp here. The first in, and only one here Oahu? on Oahu. We had at the convention center. We had 400 people from around the world come. It was completely free for everybody to attend. We had 50 speakers over two days, I think. We live streamed, which live stream didn't exist then. <laughs> this was 2008. Uh, it was it was a podcasting uh, conference and a WordPress conference, pod camp and a word camp. Um, and they just had the very, the next one, they just had one a couple months ago on Maui. So there's been a seven year gap between the, the PodCamp WordCamp and then the most recent uh, WordCamp. So yeah, uh, there's been a combination of organizing things and then speaking at these technology conferences. Okay, great. 
don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, no, it does. Well, what, what am I saying? I don't remember what your um, question was. <laughs> what about um, the difference of presenting to folks like that that are coming maybe from traveling all over versus in your own community? You know. Um, the only thing that comes to mind in terms of presenting at those other larger conferences would perhaps be a language difference. It's a pretty um, big difference. But they're, <laughs> but they're they, well, because we had people from around the world um, that came to the PodCamp, for example. But they're all there for the same reason. So they're all there to learn, perhaps, about how to use WordPress to increase their business or anything. I think at a TEDx, because there are seven or eight potentially very disparate talks, that you might be there for speaker number three, where somebody else might be there for speaker number seven. Mm -hmm. And so you're not, I wasn't necessarily speaking to my audience, whereas at a tech conference, I'm speaking to all 200 people because they're all in that room for what I have to say at that moment. But the audience here was great. They were, in, they were engaging, they were attentive. Um, yeah, it was great. Awesome. Well, we're going to use the last segment to kind of get more specific into your talk, but we're going to take one uh -oh. more quick break. Okay. Okay, thanks. thanks. Aloha. My name is Jim Sean, and I'm host of a show called Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Each week, live streaming at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, we interview people who have special insights into education from early education through K-12, all the way through higher education and beyond. Both public and private are areas we're interested in. We dig deeper, we try to find out uh, what it's really like to be involved in making change, advocating for it, how you reform, what people's philosophies are in reforming it. Uh, as I said, we're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii. And later on, you can find these interviews on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center website. We hope you join us as many times as possible. Aloha. This is Alice Lee Hagan, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Behind the Scenes and Beyond the Talk with TEDx Honolulu. Again, I'm your host, Justini Spiritu, and please join us on Twitter at Think Tech High if you have any last questions for today's guest, which is Mariko Chang, who is the curator for Artists in Residence program, as well as Shane Robinson, who was our 2015 Paradigm Shift event artist. Thank you guys again for being here. And I want to use this last segment to kind of get into your talk. And you you kind of went into with your description of, of the piece of kind of the paradigm shift that you experienced. And I was like reviewing your, your talk again, um, kind of came to mind just that uh, challenge we have with like how do we identify ourselves or or how do we introduce ourselves or how do struggling with how other people identify us or what you want to be identified with right. which then comes in with these the crisis of this like inner critic of what you want to be and what you think you're capable of or, or not capable of right. yeah and so it's really cool you, you did mention that you always wanted to be a painter mm -hmm. uh, when I was in college I when I was young, I drew things and painted things, and um, but I got sucked into computers in high school, and it, that's also very creative. And it's all in my mind; it's all about problem solving. Was that something you, you found like someone was like, "Oh, you're good at this. Let me bring you into here," or did you like find yourself? I found like, it. I found it. I don't remember how because I lived on a farm in the middle of Iowa, and we, we didn't have. I mean, we had to drive an hour to, and I bought my computer at Sears. It was, you know, Commodore 64, so there wasn't a community, and I don't remember, um, probably through magazines, I probably saw a magazine or something uh, uh, in those early years about these computer things, and 
just was immediately drawn to them. And so I taught myself how to program and went to college for computers. But it involves a lot of math. And I'm really good at computer math, but I don't get high school math. I, I, it doesn't make sense. But anyway, um, but while I was in college, I uh, found myself in an interior design class. And that led me to graphic design, which was part of the art school. And that led me into ceramics and sculpture. And I was just, I spent my days and nights in the studios and actually became a studio monitor. So I had a key so I could stay there all night long after I kicked everybody else at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and so, um, but also in my talk, I gave part of the part of the story that I related was on the first day of art school after being selected, the dean said, you know, so many of you are here, five of you are going to make yeah. it, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll let people watch the talk to get the full story. And you walk out of there, it's like, well, what's the point of the next three or four years of doing this then? But this is a different school, because I'm a little confused, because this is okay, an sorry. art school, but originally you were in school for computer. Sorry, I'm sorry, this is, this is uh, it's all the University of Iowa. Within, within large universities, you have other smaller schools, like okay. the University okay. of Iowa School of Art and Art History. The University of Iowa School of Medicine and Oncology or whatever. So once you're involved in the university, then you would apply to be accepted into one of these smaller schools. And so after I took the graphic design course, then I, ex I applied to be accepted into the School of Art and Art History. Mm -hmm. Then you choose a track uh, kind of uh, to, um, to study. So by that time, computers had left my life. Mm -hmm. I, I was involved in art. Um, a few years after graduation, I had already done, I was a potter, I had a potting, pottery studio. I built and designed furniture with this master fur, furniture maker. A friend had a very early Macintosh. And just, it came flooding back in terms of the interest. And I was looking for a job at that point. I had owned a gallery just outside of Madrid, and that wasn't fun. And that's in the talk too. <laughs> And one of my artists was the computer services manager at Kinko's, and she was quitting. And she said, well, go apply for the job. I said, I don't, I don't know. And Photoshop was new, Quark Express was new, Illustrator was new, PageMaker was new. Exciting times. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> and I said, I don't know any of those. And she goes, well, you know, I can't help you. So the night before my interview, I went to the other Kinko's and rented a computer for two hours and taught myself enough of those programs to pass the test the next day, and then I was the computer services manager. Well, that's what I mean. I, you have to be a certain kind of person, I think, to take on, you know, or even when that dean said that, you know, you hundred people, one no, of you one is going to gonna make it, an and you artist. still were like, all right, well, that sucks, but I'm going to keep going. There's a and chance. Then, <laughs> and then you know, this woman, <laughs> yeah. this woman tells you about the job, and you're like, I don't think I can do that, but somehow something in you was like, just go try it's and just, figure it me, out. It's all problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 what, what is the problem? What are the parameters of the problem? What of these parameters do I have any control over, or can I affect? These I can't, so I shouldn't worry about those. Mm -hmm. What other people think of me is not a parameter that I can mm -hmm. affect. Yeah. So why would I worry about it? Why would I carry that problem? What I think of me is a parameter that I have complete control over. So why wouldn't I work on that? Uh -huh. So, if I can go and study a computer program, or whatever it might be, for a few hours to see if that's something that might interest me or work for me, then why not do that? Why not put that little bit of time in? That led to the, services, the computer services manager job where I met my business first business partner. We built a really successful um, internet development company that I still own today with Roxanne. But that has also allowed us to live in Hawaii and then now slowly switch out of that and pursue art and come and kind of come back around full circle. That's cool. So do you feel equally passionate about the computers and the art? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question because of the use of the word passion. Um, I feel curious. So that's the word that I would use instead. Uh, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of, of weight and cultural um, stuff attached to the word passion. Like a passion is something you must pursue. This is something you must do to be true to yourself or whatever. And, okay. and that's a lot of pressure, I think. 
especially if you have to go to a job every day that you don't like. And so then there's this underlying pressure that you're constantly sat can be saddled with. And instead, be curious about, for now, mm -hmm. I'm curious about making art. Yeah, well, I, I like that. You know, the words can be can trigger different like expectations and, and stress stuff. and pressure. Yeah. Well, which is yeah. interesting because then you talk about that struggle of like identifying yourself as a computer programmer versus artist. Yes, it was very easy, and that was the last part of my talk because because for almost 18 years I've been a programmer, database architect, system uh, system administrator. Um, people understand what those are. People kind of understand what that job description entails what you should know and that type of thing and it was very easy for me I used to tell people I operate in ones or zeros true or false yes or no on or off that's the way a computer works and I was very comfortable in that world when you push the button it either works or it doesn't when I finish a painting first of all is it finished I don't know how do you know yeah is it good I don't know. Is it, I just do you think it's did good? It. I, I don't know. It's kind of unnerving, actually. <laughs> there's no, there's no yes or no, true or false, one or zero, uh -huh. and so it's a, yeah. it's, it's quite a huge. It's been quite a huge um, mind shift for me to kind of let go of the things that are very easy to quantify. Yeah, that's so healthy. I think. It's. To it's challenging. Push. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, especially in art let go of my concern about will it sell yeah is it commercially viable will people like it will they not like it that type well of that's thing. like too that you talk about like failing at ceramics and you fail at your exactly. art that's, gallery that's that's the lizard brain that's that's in the back of my mind saying why should you try this why sh why should you try this you failed at all this other stuff you're yeah. gonna fail at this too but yeah, but it's so exciting and I think something we need to remember and there's probably like tons of TED Talks on it of like failing is like super fun and great and yep. like that's you learn from that and it's mm -hmm. and it's really exciting and it's it's if you look at it if you just switch it five degrees and instead of looking at it as failing just look at it as experience learning. building and yeah. learning and that if you're trying really trying like Michael Jordan what is his quote that for every one basket he's failed at a thousand or something you can't strike hit a home one every time. Yeah. To bring that back to, um, I noticed that like your personality traits in working on this particular project, the the constraint of not being on island, of not having the opportunity to come in the day before to even set up, it didn't seem to phase you. You're like, okay, so control, how do we how do we address this? And right. it was so refreshing to to work with and so easy. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And so I'm curious too of how, as um, you know, we have a like speaker curator who's the trainer and works a lot with them. But you guys are your own little cohort mm -hmm. of yeah. like the artist residency group. So how close <laughs> did you guys work together? And did you emails every day? Yeah, every day. <laughs> there was a point. So <laughs> she. So I'll I'll toss back the the um, the compliment to her. Um, on point with her emails. They didn't contain extra fluff. They didn't need have anything that wasn't required. At that so point, that it was, was yeah, I mean, we really had to, um, it was like the constraints of resources that I think pushed everybody to elevate their their level of performance and what they needed to get done. It gave us so much focus. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I, it's just exciting to feature this program. It's just another example of, uh, you know, a creative element mm -hmm. and trying to be new and innovating and working together as a community. and it being a part of this event with everything and I thank you guys so much for coming on here to explain it further we're at the end of our show though but yeah thank you guys so much and I'm so excited to see yeah. how the program unfolds in the future yeah me too yeah, thank you thank you okay Bye. thank you guys <laughs> aloha we're clear